Namaste. Hi, I'm Bruce Benefiel, and welcome to One World. back again. This episode's guest is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, you might recognize him. Several years ago, he played the character of Wo Fat on Hawaii Five-0. This evening, I'd like to introduce to you Kai D. Kai, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Bruce. Thank you. And nice to see that you're doing so well. Ah, thanks again. Kai, I first met you, um, I believe it was in the fall of 81, and you were the rector of a Taoist temple in Tempe. How is that going? Well, we called it a sanctuary, a Taoist sanctuary, in other words, a place to take sanctuary, either in thought or feeling or however. And uh, I closed the physical facility down in January of this year. And uh, after closing the physical facility down, was because I felt that Taoism had a more universal purpose and function than being restricted to four walls. And that mm -hmm. it was a philosophy that had global aspects and it dealt with global consciousness. Something and we need now. True. So that got me into the idea of promoting with a few friends, which we are now still in the formative stages, of promoting a concept that began many, many years ago during the Wendell Wilkie era. And you're speaking of world citizenship. Yes. And in Wendell Wilkie's era, there was a young man named Gary Davis. His father was a very popular band leader, and often his orchestra played at the White House. And he started a one-world passport movement. And he issued a passport, and it cost you $10. And I believe the government's passport was $5 at the time. And I had one. I don't know what happened to it after all <laughs> these years. But you could travel with it. And America, France, and England absolutely refused to recognize it. I think Italy did recognize it. And many of the Balkan countries and many Asiatic countries recognized it. So you took both passports, and you'd have them validated when you arrive. And it was an idea that was quite right, but it was just premature. Now, a lot of people now have some qualms with this one world um, theory, at least from a, a governmental standpoint. Um, well, I think if you listen to the news and if you read, you'll discover that people all over the world not only the people of countries, but also the leaders of countries are now talking in terms of a global consciousness. As you know, in Europe, they are already discussing and getting into operation the machinery that will do away with passports so that there'll be just one passport to travel throughout Europe, anywhere. And even with the common market, which to my understanding is coming online December 22nd of 1992. This would coincide with that, as the need to break those barriers down. Exactly. So if you have a one passport for Europe, why not have one passport for the world? Makes sense. And you have all of over the world, you have many different groups that are striving to save the planet, because our planet is in trouble. It's in dire straits, you better believe we it. We are in trouble. And you have groups like Greenpeace, Sierra Club, uh, the Conservancy Group. In Australia, there's a marvelous group called um, Earth Repair. And uh, as a matter of fact, they are fascinating. I 
have some material from them that they sent from Australia. And what is interesting is that it really encourages us to get rid of the vanity. Look at this envelope. I'll let you describe it. This is what the material came in. Can you describe what that envelope is? Obviously a used envelope that they had received. A recycled envelope. And instead of using a new envelope, they've used an old envelope that they have received and they've put labels on it and filled it up and they're recycling it. And even the envelope that's inside that had some of the material that they sent was also used. Mm -hmm. And that is one way to really stop, uh, start saving the forest. And stop destroying them. And stop destroying them, yes. Because people do not realize it, but we are so interdependent with nature and with our environment, and human beings have ignored this, but yet without the trees and without the plants, we'll soon have no oxygen, not sufficient oxygen to support human life. Uh, the pollution that's going on in our industries, the amount of money that has been invested in developing nuclear power which we were promised was going to give us less expensive electricity and every year the rates go up and up and up as they bungle through this thing. And the and hazardous waste gets more and more and more. And the hazardous waste is increasing. But had they invested the same amount of money in the development of solar power, we would be much farther ahead today and perhaps there wouldn't be quite as much money to be made. Right. But there would be a healthier globe and a healthier world. And each of these groups, no matter what, uh, save the wildlife, save the squirrels, save the whales, save the, the fish and save the waters, uh, each of these have something to contribute. And that's what this little gadget that I brought in and made up was to show that each one has a function. And we can imagine that this is the world and just visualize different things erupting and disturbing it and pulling it apart. And then you think that each one of these groups is doing its little bit. Mm -hmm. But each one is like a single strand. Right. It breaks easily and anything can defeat it. But if we took several strands and wrapped them together so that we unite these groups, then break that one much harder almost and if, impossible and if we put all the groups together and this is all cut and thread this is not nylon this is all cut and thread and if we put all the groups together as world citizens in other words living with a global consciousness we could even take this and move any of the ladders or any of the equipment in this in this studio right now because we would be working as one exactly and that's just cotton, and mm -hmm. we won't even break it. And so that's what I'm saying is that all of these groups, individual groups all over the world, should begin to unite and unify under a global consciousness, under world citizenship. I notice some strides are being made already, such as with uh, Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition and their efforts to unify all races for political reasons, in that case. But nevertheless, at least those strides are being made. Yes, and we need to develop this kind of religious uh, consciousness. And when I use the word religious, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, theologies. I'm not even talking about a God concept. I'm talking about a spiritual concept, which is not necessarily theistic and is not atheistic. Mm -hmm. but it is universal, it is cosmic. And as we develop this kind of consciousness, then we will respect the other person's, quote, religious views or irreligious views because there is room for them. I remember a man, and I mentioned it in the car uh, driving here, that there was a great German scholar, mm -hmm. Max Muller, and he had, I have most of his writings, and the frontispiece 
on two of the books. One read, there never was such a thing as a false religion unless you believe that a newborn babe is a false man. And the other concept was, he that knows only one religion knows none. And when you take the word religion itself, many people know that it's composed of two Latin stems, re meaning again and ligo meaning to tie, like in ligament. And so it means to tie back to the one, in other words, to harmonize, which means that we have to learn to move on from the concept, which I think is a horrible concept, to fight for world and struggle for world peace because we have to remember that every peace treaty is dictated by the victor and never by the vanquished. And so what we have to strive for, not world peace, but world harmony. That's one of the things that when we talked about oh, a couple of years ago, that I brought up the, the issue of world peace, and you corrected me very quickly. And I, I thank you. I correct you, well, I just presented another you, point of view. You presented another point of view, yet at the same time, I felt corrected because to me it was a more complete view or perspective of what the needs of the situation were. Now knowing that, what do you find as being the fears that get in the way of the people coming together? Well, I think they're the same fears that have evolved with the evolution of humanity. So human society began probably with the individual mm -hmm. and he synthesized with nature and then he found a mate and that I like to think was the first thing finding a mate encouraged to him to go out and disregard nature he attacked a tree or something and cut it and then he carved something out of it and he presented it to his mate as an offering of respect, of love, of admiration, or whatever. And then they moved on. The family unit developed. Mm -hmm. And then the family discovered that if they got together with a lot of other families, they could make things easier for themselves. And so then the clan and the tribe developed. And there must have been families that didn't want to have anything to do with it. Just as uh, people didn't want to have anything to do with the automobile because it was an instrument of the devil. And there are people today who are beginning to move away from that and live self-sustaining lives on small farms or ranches or, or what have you and moving away from the destruction of nature, right. specifically. Right. And when we destroy nature, any part of nature, we are destroying ourselves because we are inseparably linked with it. And there's no way for us to escape that. And so they evolve from the tribal society into the city, and then the state, and then the nation. So the next societal evolution has to be global. And I would agree. We have to begin thinking <coughs> and acting in terms, and you hear it in the speech of forward-looking statesman, the president of Romania, uh, Gorbachev, uh, was interesting. Many times in his uh, visit with uh, President Bush, he didn't use the word peace. At least it wasn't translated as peace. The word was translated as harmony, mm -hmm. you see. And so we're moving toward the realization of how important that is. And what is harmony? Harmony is indispensable to anything that you do in life. Whether you're cooking a recipe, you must have a harmonious uh, proportion of ingredients. Right. If you're driving, you must have a harmonious consideration of other people on the road if there's not to be an accident and mayhem. If, if you're hunting, if you're doing business, there must be some kind of harmony. If you're shopping, everything requires harmony. And so that should be our object and our project now is to emphasize developing harmony, getting ourselves into the harmonious flow. As a side shoot, if you will, of the aspect of harmony, some feel that harmony for them is driving down the freeway with a 357 in the glove box. 
and anybody who gets in their way, you know, they open fire on. We, we're having that today. Well, I think How do you see that being negated, or not necessarily negated, but being restructured, being um, educated so that... Well, all throughout nature, you will find aberrations. True. And so we cannot do away totally with the aberrative, the manifestation of aberrations. And so we have to learn to accommodate them and handle them in a constructive and creative way to the best of our ability. If we didn't no have one has ever said life was going to be without problems. That's true. And without those problems, those adversities or those aberrations, we wouldn't have the necessity to grow with them, to develop constructive ways of integrating those various things in our society as a whole. Right. I remember in, in the sanctuary our ceremonies, we had a little passage that said, uh, I will use all negative experiences as challenging opportunities. That's one of the things I enjoyed most about coming there, was that kind of instruction. And, and it works. this is the way to do We Don't deny that there are going to be negative experiences. Embrace them. Yes. But our difficulty is that we often have a tendency to think in terms of absolutes, which has been imposed upon us by Aristotle, uh, upon Western culture. And you think in terms of good and evil. And those terms are ruinous to our consciousness because there is no thing that is absolutely good or absolutely evil. Things are desirable and undesirable. And what is desirable at one time may not be desirable at another time. I think of that marvelous passage in the Judeo-Christian scripture in Ecclesiastes. There is a time and season for every purpose under heaven. A time to laugh and a time to cry. A time for peace and a time for war. A, a yin and yang and yin and yang. A time mm -hmm. to plant and a time to reap a time to build and a time to tear down. And everything has its time and its place, its season. And when we recognize that, then we do not react so horribly to the undesirable situations, but we take that as a challenging opportunity to be creative. Right. And also, too, depending on our perspective, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you have the opportunity to rise above a situation and look at its constituent parts, some of those parts, although they may seem undesirable, are necessary in order for the process to become complete. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, whether it's desirable or undesirable is something that's personally determined. Mm -hmm you see, by our own experience and by our own individual values and by our individual Choice. selfishness. Right. And uh, I, I'd like, about eight years ago, I wrote, which I'm using in the World Citizenship Movement, mm -hmm. I wrote a pledge, if I may read that <coughs> sure. to you. As an awakened human being, I declare myself to be a global citizen. I pledge allegiance to the planet Earth on which I live. I shall not participate in any activity that will scar its terrain with the surgery of war. Neither shall I accord with activities that contribute to polluting its waters with deadly chemical waste. Nor shall I support technological procedures that contaminate its atmosphere or its global substance with radioactive residue. I recognize all human beings as my planetary companions. I shall renounce every command and summons that would cause me to inflict non-personally motivated harm or injury upon another human being. I perceive that each person shares with me the societal responsibility of creating and maintaining a world that offers all of its denizens a safe, habitable, and enriching interlude of existence. To this intent, I am sworn. 
I think that's something that each one of us that are conscious of the situation could stand behind. Yes, well, what are you saying, doing with it? Well, we're trying to get it circulated throughout the world. I'm sending it uh, to the United Nations. I've sent it to statesmen. I've sent it to uh, writers, musicians. You see, if we can get people like rock and roll musicians, uh, like uh, artists, like great sportsmen, mm -hmm. uh, to adopt a global consciousness and declare themselves a citizen of the world, a citizen of the globe, of the planet Earth, then that will encourage many other people to do the same. And it was interesting, and, and I'm digressing right now, it was interesting that today they had the beginning of the young people with a race of solar-operated automobiles going from here to Detroit, you see. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking in the right direction. It sure seems that way. Yes. Numbers. How many do you hope to reach by the end of the year? Well, that depends upon how many people send in contributions or something to, to help us cover the mailing and the printing of uh, the, the pledge of planetary mm -hmm. allegiance to mail it out. And mailing costs are not cheap when you're They're talking of mailing out a lot of right. things. I know I've, I've done direct mail. And, and Yes, but you see, one of the things I've always done, even with the sanctuary, I never took, uh, what do they call, non-profit mailing mm -hmm. privileges. Because it has always been my feeling that any organization should pay the full postage so that the average citizen doesn't have to make up for the lesser postage that many organizations do send things out with, whether they're business advertisement or colleges or, or churches or whatever, that to me, good citizenship is to bear your part of the responsibility of administering government and of financing government. So everything we've ever sent out from the sanctuary has always been first-class mail. Good. I've, in respect of that, uh, some of the things that I've talked to various people about are something like a, a, a tax reform that would be inclusive, where the nonprofit status, as opposed to the profit status, wouldn't matter. That it'd be such, something like a straight 15 percent. That way, we could all share in the responsibility, and none of us necessarily being hurt by such, and that programs could be adopted to support the needs of the basic people. I mean, which there's today most of our people are at poverty level or below. There's no need for that much of a percentage. There was the very large, I can't remember his name, Leibowitz or something, in New York State, who was a tax attorney. Mm -hmm. And he had, we had him on the Long John Neville show years and years ago on WOR. And he presented, he had worked out all the statistics, and he said that what we, the government should do is to have a 2% tax on every business, every church, every college, every organization in the country, and the government would have more money than even it could waste. Isn't that what Saudi Arabia does now? I don't know. I, I believe that they have a straight 2% tax on everybody. Right. If a child, if, if your son got $10, mm -hmm. 20 cents would go to the government. You see? And no one could look like today many citizens complain because big business has this exemption, that exemption, and so forth, and they don't need it. Any charitable organization, any church, is not going to miss 2% of what it gets, mm -hmm. you see. And yet, the amount of money that would flow into the government coffers would be almost unimaginable. It could probably wipe out our debt in 10 years. Just by mere participation, I'm sure that that would be true, right. and get well, people to, to rally behind that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what can what can people do to propagate the idea of the world citizenship? How can they get involved? Well, they could write to us if they wish to. World citizens. 
at Post Office Box, may I give the number? Sure. 27806 Tempe, uh, Arizona 85285. And I'll also give the P.O. Box for One World at the end of the show so that in case people didn't get that, they'll be able to see it and write it down, and I in turn can forward, forward that to you. Fine. And we'll acquaint them with what we're doing. We're trying to get a newsletter out once every two months and so forth to announce the progress and announce the new people that are joining the movement. Now, these booklets that you have here, yes. Kai, what do these cost to print? I don't know how much they cost to print, but I think someone figured out that we needed a dollar fifty in order to cover the cost of it, the paper, the printing, and the postage, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I've read through it. It is some very interesting material, and it is entitled World Citizens, A Consummate Evolution for the 21st Century, Visualizing the Whole Universe as One Thing which, from your standpoint, and especially with Adele, and I really don't see that any organized religion, be it Christian, uh, Taoist, pagan, whatever, is less than looking at something as a whole. We have fractionalized it in our various um, churches and, and sects, in all the religions, but the essence of that, the common thread, if you will, is that it is one, and we are one people. Yes, one of the interesting things is that usually the founders of so-called spiritual movements, whether you call them religious or not, mm -hmm. uh, have a concept of a cosmic consciousness, and it's the followers that come along and then begin to fracture it right. and compartmentalize it, you see, uh, rather than continuing the global or cosmic concept and encouraging that. They look at the messenger and not the message. Right. I agree, and it seems to be prevalent today where we have so many different types of religions and, and new ones being brought about all the time, whether that you can call them cults or not. I think any organized religion, be it um, the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, the Islamic faith, or, or whatever, is a cult in that respect. Yet we sometimes see these uh, other organizations that may be smaller in numbers, but have a more true concept of the reality of oneness. I wouldn't say more true. These are words that we have to, to, to play with and think okay. about them. Sure. Uh, but have a more embracing better concept, you see, because there's a tendency to alienate ourselves. Uh, I always find it rather interesting that so many of the religions teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and yet if you're of this religion, you can't marry someone of that religion. And where's mom in the process? Exactly. And uh, it's a strange thing. You know, because the activity and the practice violates the concept that is enunciated. So that in, in many ways, uh, many religions become verbal mm -hmm. rather than things of action. Right. Right. What advice can you give to our listeners to help embrace that totality of oneness in their everyday lives as they move through time? I think each person has to find their own way. Okay. And there are many people that have sectarian uh, religious beliefs that can still behave and function globally. Great. Thank you again for being here, Kai D. Thank you. And I thank you all for listening. I hope that you're with us next week. And again, namaste. The divine within me recognizes the divine within you. May you go in peace and harmony.